being a paramedic. It's something that I always had set my heart on to do. Ambulance emergency. From ambulance, please. It's a child falling in a walk. We always have to be looking out for everyone. There's a lot of rest on our shoulders as the first people on scene at a lot of incidents. Right, OK, tell me exactly what happened. 17-year-old female gasping for breath. Back for two, It's a humbling job. It also makes you appreciate how fortunate you've been in life. Whether you're in the islands, you know, the north of the city, your skills have to be good. It's a 26-year-old male in Serving a population of over 5 million, the Scottish Ambulance Service is unique. We need car RTC, no, mate. We'll arrive in literally five minutes. It covers one entire country. We've got a couple of guys on top of this Norwich. A vast and diverse landscape. I'm organising help for you now. Stay on the line. Oh, my God. This series follows the men and women of the Scottish Ambulance Service. On the front line, first on scene at medical emergencies, right across the nation. Probably the first time I've ever nearly cried at a job. I don't want to give people false hope. Keeping Scotland safe and alive. Just take keep your eyes open for us. Just let me know that you're all right. They are coming as fast as they can, all right? 265 on scene, over. This time... We have a category red response. A Highland accident scrambles the air ambulance. A 999 call to a moped mishap. Looks not bad, Nicker, considering. When you get to the track, if you walk straight down, it will take you to another piece of iron duct. The special operations team search for a missing person in the Clyde. I'm not too sure exactly why they went in. I don't know if it was just them were mucking about. Kids have been daft. Man down. And there's blood on the carpet at the community centre. Looks like you've got a real uh, ding dong injury under there. Perth Airport, early afternoon. Hi, Med76, Rich speaking. The paramedics at Scotland's charity air ambulance get an emergency call. OK, anybody else tasked mountain rescue, um, anything like that? Not at the moment, the police are aware of it. Airborne within five minutes, this helicopter can reach 90% of the population in under half an hour. For Scotland's far-flung rural communities, it's a lifeline. We can get these patients in half the time of a road ambulance, so it's a fantastic asset. Responding to emergency calls today, air ambulance paramedics Rich and JP. And you've got a quad bike accident. It has landed on this gentleman. Have you got a grid reference? November, November, 909-497. Right, that's probably less than 10 minutes for us, so I'd imagine Fantastic. overhead roughly 1355-ish. We'll give you a shout once we're up in the air, but that's us heading out the door. Thank you very much. We got tasked to a gentleman that had rolled a quad bike on a hill near Aberfeldy, and it was in quite an inaccessible location. We just got the information that he couldn't walk. He tried to get up and couldn't walk. So that could mean a lot of different things. We do go to a number of these quad bike accidents, and they do tend to be fractured backs. You've got your spinal cord, which runs between your vertebrae. Uh, and if they are impinged or, or, or broken through, you're, you're, you're looking at paralyzing uh, injuries, uh, you know, which is life completely life changing. <laughs> Well, that is just to say that we have lifted uh, in the air en route to Griffith Forest, Aberfeldy, with uh, an ETA of five minutes from now, which uh, would be 13.57. Uh, overhead, over. Based on the coordinates they've been given, the paramedics fly northwest over Perthshire. Locating a casualty in this vast landscape is a challenge for even the most eagle-eyed crew. Uh, right, I think, uh, how about... We've got a couple of guys on top of this little thing here, this little ridge, uh, waving at us and there's a quad bike. Oh, we've got low, low, low now. Roger. 
Patient located, now for the next problem, finding somewhere safe to land. There is a rock behind you, but just be on the tail now. Got it. When we're landing in an unsurveyed site, uh, the pilot needs one of us up front looking for dangers. Obviously, if you're going into an unsurveyed site, um, we don't know for certain there are no wires or all these kind of things. Extra dangers, so it's all eyes out. Just minutes after the 999 call came in, the air ambulance paramedics are on the ground ready to treat their patient. Hello, ambulance service. What's the telephone number that you're calling from, please? 100 miles away in Glasgow. 999 road activated. Paramedic Fraser and technician Johnny are on shift. Five apologies, need to drive out to red, call over. Yeah, no worries, wherever it's red. Uh, brother, he's sorry, he's really looking up. Get to him, I'll just send the details just now over. Been around. Pretty much, so loud. From the call, the crew don't know what caused the crash, or if the rider is badly hurt. But coming off a scooter can be serious. There's no time to waste. Obviously need to find the reason of how she's managed to crash, you know, if she's been unwell before crashing or if it's, she's just skidded and lost control. You're running through a wee process in your head of how am I going to examine this patient based on your kind of trauma algorithm, if you like, just to make sure you don't miss anything. Having a wee try to draw on past experiences uh, and thinking through all the drugs and interventions that you might carry out. Just on the way there, just worst case scenario. And approaching the scene, this does look worse than the average two-wheel tumble. The scooter's not in a very good nick. Upside down. The scooter was on its nose, wedged against the lamppost. Still not sure how it got like that, but it was it looked quite a traumatic incident, if you like, yeah. So it was interesting. The scooter looks like a write-off, but what about the rider? Will we take can I take this off quickly? Is that okay? Many 999 calls involve vehicles, but very few happen miles off-road. Back on the moors above Aberfeldy, the air ambulance paramedics have reached the patient, Ian, a deer manager who fell off his quad bike. Hi, Ian. My name's Rich. So how are we doing? You've been awake the whole time. Yeah, Do you remember okay. what time did it happen? Do we know? He's injured and in a lot of pain. The patient was lying on his back in absolute agony. You can imagine a, a, a quite a, a heavy quad bike roll on top of you. And we'd get quite a few quad bike accidents. When they do tip, they can roll quite significantly and you can be entwined in it when it's rolling. Now the paramedics need to assess Ian's injuries and work out how to get him off the hill. I think there's always a certain amount of relief when you first clap eyes on your patient and um, you can see that he's alert and he's talking. Um, there's definitely relief in that. You know that um, yeah, he's not as bad as he could be. Where's Saw just now? Where's Saw? Where hurts? Bottom of your back. Bottom of your back. Where the deer manager is uh, in this area, uh, he's been extracting a uh, deer carcass that was shot earlier this morning. He's come up this slight gradient here, and uh, the bike's actually come over on top of him. He informed me, and then I uh, got these guys rallied. Nice deep breaths. Is that sore when I touch? Yeah. Yeah. Right side seems to take it worse. Not so the left, the left side of your chest. Yeah. And nice deep breath. So if I just feel around this Hang left on, hip, that, that's sore. that was sore. You yeah. started a wee bit yeah. when I just pressed in yeah. there. Yeah. That, that's not too bad. No. So Ten left. Not... So the left hand side's taking the brunt. Left chest. Yeah. Left hip. Okay. He had some bruising, some pain around his chest, um, but he had good air entry on both sides. So we're reasonably happy with that. He had pain in his pelvic area quite a big bone, so any fracture has the potential for internal bleeding, quite a big space to bleed into, so that's something where we treat cautiously. 
And then he had pain in his back as well. Yeah, that sounds like a good it, plan. What's the pain at the moment? With 10 being the worst pain and zero being nothing? All right. If, if I was to move at all, I'd be screaming out. Right. Okay. Yeah. So obviously our problem is, sunny as nice as it is right now, we obviously need to move you. We can't leave you here all day. So it is going to be a wee bit sore. Yeah, that's right. So what were you just uh, stalking or uh, just, just doing a wee cull up here? Or? Extracting, yeah, dear. Extracting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, well. What was I doing? Oh, I was uh, taking the deer out. You've got a beast on the back of your quad bike, so... Yeah. I'll... I presume that I was... Mean, it's chilly wee hill. I know, I know. These, yeah. these things just catch you out sometimes. Yeah. Strax is a man who doesn't he bother the doctor very often. No. <laughs> the plan is, we're going to put a wee needle in, into your arm, give you some morphine, give you something just to take the edge off the pain. Okay, do a bit more of an assessment of you, and then it's going to be trying to get you on a stretcher and up into the aircraft, because obviously you've chosen a bit of a tricky spot for a road ambulance to get to. And then it might be a wee trip to Dundee. Once we'd assessed him, because generally it's, we move all these clothes to assess, then it's getting him wrapped up again, keeping him warm. Something that we have that's slightly different to the road crews, we have extra blankets and the like, and we have these heat warmer packs. With any trauma patients, Hypothermia is one of the big considerations. Have you had morphine before? I don't think so. So, Mike, just take the edge off the pain. Might make you feel a wee bit spaced out. How heavy are you? 15 stone, I don't know. I'll probably give you something to stop you feeling sick as well. Um, just because the morphine can make you feel sick and you're going to be lying down in the helicopter. I don't travel well. Oh, yeah. Well, that's okay, a double, that's we'll double give... reason for us giving you something for that as well. Oh. Does it make you feel a bit woozy? I don't know, I'd feel funny. Yeah, it does. It goes around your body quite quick. It's like having a strong few drams in a wanna. It's still not clear how serious Ian's injuries are. He has to be assessed in hospital as soon as possible. But with Rich and JP the only paramedics on scene, moving him is risky. They need to make a decision. This uh, road crew's not going to get anywhere near this, so we're going to go, we're going to actually work with the guys that are with them and get him back into the aircraft, get him up to hospital. How's that morphine? Yeah. Or is it just my dulcet tones that send you to sleep? <laughs> I do have that effect, especially on my colleagues, to be honest. Really well done. And just say when you're ready. You're doing really well. Okay, I'm in on this side. Okay, and then roll. Ready, set, roll. Good. And Nice and like keep your head nice and still. You just relax in. Ready, Except set, remember roll. Remember to let go of the trousers so there, away from it. Nice and gentle. Okay. All right, that should that's be enough. Yeah, East Ham, that's uh, us ready. To... Patient is now packaged. We're going to move patient to the aircraft. We have a category red response. We try and land slightly below the patient if we can, because that makes it easier to carry down to the aircraft. But for this guy, we had to land just above, just because that was a suitable spot, not too close to him. I think right. straight up this line so here. So left of the dirt. Yeah. Do you want to oh, oh, go? Ready, okay. brace and lift. Yep. Oh, well done. Exactly. Can you levitate me? So it was a bit of a steep slope um, to get him up, but we got him onto our um, scoop stretcher. And because we had his pals there, there's uh, maybe three or four of them around. So using those guys, we were able to get him up the bank. And it was quite steep. It was still something we we're having to be very careful getting him up on fairly loose ground. Uh, but they were a big help. Can we the Happy. Okay, you're safe. Just, just an hour after the 999 call, Ian is safely stowed in the air ambulance and bound for the nearest trauma centre in Dundee. I'm Rosani, this is Helimed 76. We have an ETA on the pad of uh, 10 past the hour, so 1510. Over. Ian's clearly badly hurt, but without the air ambulance paramedics' quick response, things could have been a lot worse. Obviously, there's potential a quad bike rolling over him. I mean, he could have killed himself already. It could have been a traumatic cardiac arrest. There could have been, he might have been beyond help before we'd got there. Um, the good thing about this job was we were only 10 minutes away, so um, we got there pretty quickly after it happened, managed to find him quickly. When we 
speak to patients afterwards, the noise of the aircraft coming, the fact that they know help's coming, gives them a huge amount of hope to get them into hospital, to get them back out the other side. So you can imagine the air arms plays a significant part in that chain of survival for our patients. Hello. How are we? I'm Fraser. Back in Glasgow, paramedic Fraser is dealing with another bike crash. Patient Diane has ridden her scooter straight into a fence and a lamppost. Parking sensor really, is it switched off? Is there fuel leaking? Is there a risk of fire? Do we need the, the fire brigade to come out? Because also it's standing on its, on its nose. Um, and we just left it because it was safe. We moved the patients away from that and left it for the recovery to figure out how they're going to get that out of the lamppost. Keeping an eye on the mangled moped, Fraser assesses Diane's injuries. You just stay there, just relax, I'll have a wee look at it. You know, sometimes it tells a wee story if you've bashed your head or hit your head off anything solid, but... Looks not bad nicker, eh, considering. <laughs> OK, whereabouts are you feeling it sore? Down in your left-hand side. Arms are OK, you're moving them quite well. And it's a bit sore down here. You seem quite relatively unscathed, considering that that's sitting like that. So that's good news. So the plan is we'll get you in the back of the ambulance and uh, we'll get your, your boot in that off then, I think. She has no obvious head injuries, but Diane is complaining of pain in her leg. She's been ejected from a, from a bike. Um, she's got a distracting injury, i.e. her ankle, which is very sore. Um, but it, it doesn't mean that she's not got a neck fracture or a back fracture or something inside that we can't see. And obviously there's the high potential for like organ damage and things like that. It's when she's came off that bike, has she struck the handlebars, has she struck this fence? Someone has been struck, it'll need further investigation in hospital in case she's done any internal damage. Footage of the crash from a security camera on a nearby house reveals how lucky Diane was to avoid a head injury or worse. But assessing trauma injuries can be challenging. Sometimes the damage isn't immediately obvious. Inside the ambulance, Fraser runs some more checks. So give me, give me a, a wee wiggle of your toes. Good. You feel me touching? And you feel me touching that side? Yeah. OK. And what about when I touch the outside of your ankle here? Sore? OK. So it looks quite swollen, so obviously it'll need an X-ray. Diane is being given gas and air to help control the pain. She may have a broken leg. The paramedics give her some stronger pain medication and create a support for her leg to prevent any further damage. All right, so right, keep taking that. Hold on to get your hand on that. Nice and cold. Hey, is it cold? <laughs> All right, okay. Just get you some ice and send you on your way. <laughs> I'm just messing. We also take like our vital signs and we monitor the patient and thankfully with all our numbers, apart from being in a little bit of pain, we're all pretty good. And um, so we manage our pain and once we got sort of the ankle under control, not trying to mask any other pain, you give another assessment just to make sure that you're constantly monitoring, make sure nothing's changed with that patient. And you can still feel me touching? Wiggle your toes a wee bit. Good. How's your pain doing now? You've had some morphine. Dull thud, maybe five. five. Well, that's good. Getting less okay. good. Pain under control, Diane can be taken to hospital for an X-ray to confirm whether her leg is broken. The fate of her scooter is yet to be decided. Right, what can you see beside you? A river, a field with sheep. He's been here a while because my son, he's just eight and he managed to get a hold of me. Are you with him just now? Are you with the patient just now? I'm actually, like, uh, he's sitting in the bank and there's no way I can get down with foot falling. He's, he can't move his left side, he can't talk, and my, he's a big, dirty, dirty giant. He just wants to speak and I can't see anything. Right, it's OK, no, we're going to help him, OK? So tell you think he's took a stroke? <laughs> Any suspected stroke is a time-critical emergency. Patients need to be treated within four and a half hours. But with this call, there's an extra problem. The patient is stuck on a riverbank far from the road, so the special operations team are being dispatched to assist. They have the training and kit to get to patients wherever they are and bring them in. Five, three, zero, two, one, 
Paramedic Brian is on his way. We're going to have a 60 odd year old gentleman who has been out fishing down beside the river and he's had a stroke. There's a crew on scene reporting that he's about eight feet down an embankment and they can't get the patient up. So the crew have asked for our assistance to get him extricated up the embankment. Then he is across three fields as well. So he's quite inaccessible at the moment. In Scotland, strokes kill almost 4,000 people a year, but patients can recover if they are treated quickly. So the paramedics need to find a way to reach and retrieve this fisherman. Luckily, Brian and his team have a solution, an off-road vehicle that can tackle the toughest terrain. Got a 6x6 off-road vehicle and with patient carrying capability, and that's utilised actually it's probably one of our most utilised bits of kit within special operations. The location is in the countryside 30 minutes from base, and the weather is taking a turn for the worse. Yeah, it's obviously quite cold outside. It's also raining now um, as we're heading towards Ayrshire. I've no idea at this time what time these symptoms started. So uh, it's quite imperative that we get there, get them up and get them off the hospital as quick as we can. You've got four and a half hours from the onset of a stroke um, to be treated in hospital. So we were obviously conscious that this patient had to be taken back to the ambulance and taken into the hospital. Sort 3502, ambulance crew on scene, over. The casualty is still some distance away, across three waterlogged fields. There's another ambulance crew with him, but they can't move him. The off-road vehicle still hasn't arrived, but Brian wastes no time in getting to the patient. Take the ropes down, the guys are asking for stretchers, but they'll come on the Polaris and then we'll get down and get down and get dirty. You take us to there and then come back. We were directed in by the farmer and the farmer took myself and John and over to the, the patient. In the grand scheme of things, it wasn't remote, it was just out the way, right off the beaten track. Finally, Brian and his team reached the patient. Despite his stroke, he's conscious, alert and able to talk them through what happened. Still a wee field there, Pete. What's your name, sorry? I'm John. I'm John as well. Nice to meet you, John. John. Nice to meet you, John. Crew on scene had already had everything done, and um, they just couldn't get the patient physically moved. I'm just going to update my control, let them know what's happening, and, and find out how long this wee script and my wee golf buggy's going to be to get just you back get, up. I was just getting a bit breathless again there. Yeah. Must have been really frightening as well, mate. You just need to feel better just talking to you, you scared, I mean. And it turns out John has been lucky. His eight-year-old grandson was with him out here on the riverbank. He raised the alarm with his mum, who then called 999. That grandson of mine, his name's Greg. But my soldier, he's been... John seems stable, but he still needs to be checked in hospital as soon as possible. Most important question, John. Yeah. We caught a salmon, that's the thing. <laughs> it's it's all first, wild, it's it's now all the paramedics can do is wait for the all-terrain vehicle to arrive and try and move him. Paramedic Colin and technician Dan have been working as a team in Edinburgh for the past 18 months. So tomorrow, I'll pack all my stuff. I'll be ready, it'll be all good. And then I'll pick They're making weekend plans when they get a call. So what to do, let's set a time. Yeah, let's swap. This call is for a patient transfer from here at the Royal Infirmary to the Western General Hospital on the other side of the city. This type of job is classed as urgent rather than emergency. So we have a 59 years old female that she's currently in Ward 106 at the hospital. Uh, she has diverticulitis, so that is when you know how you, you've got your bowel, and you've got your large intestine and your small intestine? Well, uh, essentially part of it kind of pouches out and stuff can get trapped in there and it gets inflamed and that's, a, that's diverticulitis. Yeah. This can be quite nasty actually. But she needs to get to the, to the Western. The Western has more gastrointestinal uh, capability in terms of it has specialist doctors and 
that's where GI problems get looked at, so that's where she's transferred to. It's a routine task, but it's still a vital part of the service. I'll just park us here, you know that. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, mate. That'll do, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Depending on their condition, a patient's health could go downhill quickly. So they need to be monitored all the time. Here we go. If something was to go wrong during the transfer, Jeff, I can do something about it. And if something was really big, then I, we can stop the ambulance, get the person that is driving, so get Colin back at the back, and this point is two of us, and we can perform all sorts of uh, procedures in order to then restabilize the patient and carry on the transfer. For the transfer, we'll just kind of keep that uh, probe on your finger, so I can keep an eye on your heart rate and your oxygen level. The only thing is, it's Colin driving, so we're going to keep the seat belts on, all right? Because you never know. Right, Dan, you good to go? Yeah, I'm good to go. Oof. I told that door, eh? Who's the boss? <laughs> yeah. Did you just say, who's the boss? Who's the boss of the ambulance? Me. <laughs> <laughs> the journey to the Western takes about half an hour. This means that Dan and Colin won't be available for any other emergency calls. We have different categories of vehicles for different things. I would imagine because there's not enough 999 calls or there's not a lot of 999 calls coming in, eh, they've allocated us to this urgent because we're, we're an available resource and they don't have another available resource to complete it. In the back, Dan is keeping a close eye on Jeanette. She seems to be having some problems with her breathing. We sleep apnea. You know what? In a way, I'm glad you told me that. Because while you were just, you just dozed off for a few seconds and your saturation of oxygen just plummeted down. So I was wondering if it was something like that. Okay, it's good to know. This job is so autonomous, scarily autonomous kind of do your training and then it's just me and Dan. You go and see a patient and we get on with it and that's it. Uh, it's a big degree of responsibility. It's, it's, but it's, it's very satisfying as well, like you say, because you're kind of given the keys to get on with it and, and look after patients to your own standard. And that's really exciting. That's why I became a paramedic really. After a smooth drive across town, Jeanette is safely delivered to the Western so she can receive the specialist treatment she needs. Back in Ayrshire, stroke patient John is still stuck on a steep riverbank. The special operations team have been dispatched to retrieve him with their all-terrain vehicle, which has finally arrived on scene. The chap was um, fishing with his grandson, and it took quite a bit of time for the to find the gentleman, I believe. Grandson Greg is now safely back with his family, but Grandad John is still stuck, and the clock is ticking. Just as, as flat as you can get the back it to that wee hill, so we can just pretty much bring him over. Basically, we'll get this buggy thing as close as we can. We'll get you on the back of that, and then we'll get you up. All right? Aye. Well, he had a weakness in his leg. Um, it, it, was, it was a weakness down his one side, um, and it wouldn't have been feasible to walk the patient that distance, um, especially if he was having a stroke. You're not wanting to increase his heart rate or increase his blood pressure. That's one patient you want to try and keep calm um, and make it as, a, as smooth as possible. Right, big man, all we're going to do is pull you up there. OK, yeah. on three, one, two, three. <laughs> one, last one, one, two, three. <laughs> oh. Right, so the plan, guys, is we're going back up. We'll slide him on there, he'd first. There is a wee bit of dirt that might be a bit of slide, so we'll just take Don't it nice and slow, right? We'll call it out for lift on three. On you, John. Ready? Yeah. One, two, three. Just nice, slow, guys. Safely off the bank, John can be transported back to the road, where an ambulance is waiting to rush him to hospital. No, it's you in. No, stop. That's fine. If that wasn't available, it would have been a case of um, pairs of hands and we would have put him on a stretch and walked him across the field. Right, we call it a golf buggy. 
We don't get much golf done, Dan. If you've got six or eight people walking across, you're going to need to stop for breaks. Could have added another hour onto that. Taking this muddy field in its stride, the buggy gets John to the ambulance within minutes, saving valuable time. We were obviously conscious that we were now pushing maybe two and a half hours for that job. You do see that a lot with stroke patients, that the stroke will maybe start to rectify a little bit and their weakness will maybe ease off and the droopiness of the face will ease off. They're able to speak a bit better. Um, but at the end of the day, he still had a, a cerebral event. You know, it's still, when he needs to be treated within that four and a half hours. That's you. You're going to need to get this. You're going to need to get shorter. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. What? Any time. It's nice to be appreciated. We don't go out to be appreciated, but it's nice to nice to get a thanks then again. Two hours after his daughter called 999, John is on his way to hospital. So they'll pre-alert the hospital, they'll radio ahead, tell the hospital they're coming in with this gentleman. Um, there's a short window just to get him in, get him seen if he's having a stroke. So they'll have a team waiting on him to see him as soon as he comes in. I think the good thing that day for that chap was that his grandson was with him. Because if he was on his own, it may have been a different outcome. In Edinburgh, it's Monday morning and it's raining. Specialist paramedic Matt is on the day shift. So we've been called to an emergency. Just ahead, to the left. At Wrestle Rig Road, which is on the east side of Edinburgh. The information that I've been given so far is that it is for a 98-year-old male who has fallen. I've been allocated to it as, uh, my, as my specialist role. Uh, the hope is that this patient will not need hospital treatment. Uh, I've been told that he's got uh, an injury to his head, so we'll know pretty quickly. Matt is one of a growing number of paramedics, specially trained to respond as a one-man band. We are used as a pre-hospital triage tool almost, um, somewhere between the ambulance service and the uh, general practitioner service, and we will find the best treatment plan for each patient. When people call 999, they are asking for help, I suppose, and that help may not always be to take them to hospital. Um, with 98-year-olds, there's bound to be some chronic conditions, some underlying chronic conditions, possibly multiple long-term conditions that are quite complex. Might not, might be a very healthy 98-year-old, but we'll see. You have reached your destination. This is a community hub. So it looks like we're going in there. We'll just park up here. Hi there. Are we in here? Where do we go? Oh, I see. Man down. So it's Frank, is it? Is that right? Hi, oh, yeah. My name's Matt. Hello, Frank. Hello, Matt. Hiya. If you could tell me what happened to Frank, that'd be great. Were you feeling dizzy before you fell? No, no. Were you feeling no. sick at all? No, no. So you think it's just a, oh, a balanced no, trip? A just a chew? The shoe caught the and I lost my balance. Excellent. Well, that's good, because it means it's probably not a medical cause. It's just oh, a balance no, thing. It looks like you've got a real uh, ding-dong injury under there. Do you mind if I take that away to have a look at what's no, underneath? Right, I'm going to just lift this up over, Frank. Oh, aye. There you go. That's a decent-sized wound you've got there. They'll call me Scarface now. They will call you Scarface. <laughs> it's going to need probably uh, probably four or five wee stitches there, I think, to hold that together, because it's, it's a it's a Y shape, and it's quite uh, it's probably about an inch and a half long. Was he knocked out at all? No. 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 Talking straight away. Yeah. And. Have you got any pain anywhere else? No. No, just the head, eh? Let's see if we can get that back on. Will that go back over? Are you wanting to sit up in a chair? Aye, but the glasses weren't strong. Well, I was too heavy. <laughs> we're told not to move you. We're told not to move you. Because hey, hey, hey. Somebody's seen you. We'll just get you up into the one that you're in, eh? Yeah, yeah. Quite Push. heavy, mate. It's OK. All right, and rubble back, Frank. Oh! Thanks, you are you all right? <laughs> 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 your ankle, so you hurt your ankle when you went there? No, no, I just couldn't be pressing it. Right. 
3793 receiving. We're going to need an ambulance to take the gentleman in for uh, sutures in his forehead. Uh, if you just uh, make it a level two response at this time. And could you tell me a rough ETA for that, please? Over. Back up. Um, I'll have to wait for my crew from that hospital because it's clear of the next year. Many thanks. Give us a shout if there's going to be any delay on that. <laughs> Don't say that, now there'll be ages. <laughs> Isolated head injuries are quite common with the ageing population. It's obviously one of the problems with ageing is, is mobility. As elderly persons rightly try and stay active, but also it just means that they're having, they're, they're doing more activities, they're out and about much more. So have you slipped on those shoes before? No, but they stick a lot of things at home. Right, it seemed like the right sort of shoe, but oh, if they've caused the fall on this occasion, then it's obviously not great. Sore anywhere else at all, your knees, hips? Yeah, but you to go, but... Okay, the left felt a bit sore. A bit. Is, that, is that new since you've fallen? I know, I just... Yeah, let us have a wee feel then. Is it sore where I'm pressing? Okay. And what about if I move it? Is that brand new? How's that feel? All right. Can I get a sleeve out for a blood pressure like I said that I would? Is that OK? Aye, aye. Can I get a sleeve? Aye. Do you live on your own? Aye. And do you manage OK at home? Well, I've got a daughter around the corner. OK. And have you got, like, the... When you're in the house, have you got the community alarm? I've got the facilities. And your faculties. Facilities and faculties. What more do you need? That was a minor mistake. No, 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 you were right. You were, no, you were dead right, you do. You picked the correct word for what you were trying to say. He was a good guy, good character. He was very popular in the community centre and it was immediate, it was really obvious to see why. And so it made the it made communication with him, just the communication with the patient straight away a whole lot easier. It's all part of the treatment, is to develop a rapport to help him in that way as well. What's your date of birth, Frank? 22nd of March, 1924. 22nd of March? Aye. So is mine. <laughs> There's a coincidence, isn't it? Sorry, what year? 1924. 24? Ah, oh, 78 I was. And so how old are you, Frank? 94. 94, wow, wee. Oh, is this she's back? really impressed. Yeah, you'll be old soon, eh? With Matt's work here almost done, an ambulance arrives to take Frank to hospital, where he'll be patched up. How lucky can you be? Two coming in. I know, lovely. Good grief, it's a lucky day. So this is Frank. Frank has uh, had a mechanical fall. He wasn't feeling dizzy or unwell. Obviously, he's got an isolated head injury. It's a Y shape just above his eyebrow on the right-hand side there. All right, Frank, this is Siobhan and Laura. We'll get you to the ambulance. Is that all right? Oh, and he's got a pacemaker. All right. Does he think he's going to mess with the Royal? Sorry, but he's Royal Pass, I don't think so. And this is all he had. Morning, Gavin. This gentleman is just a. Uh, Lively, outgoing guy. It was nice to spend time with him. Even the short amount of time that I was with him, he was uh, sort of he was lighting up the room. And, and uh, I think that would also come down to the the community centre, though, is that it was also the staff that were there were extremely helpful, um, and they were they were good fun as well. And even though the 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 health of the patient is paramount and wasn't forgotten at any time, you know, they're just the. The, the good spirit that was there with the other visitors to the community centre and the staff. It was just a nice, uh, nice situation to be part of. Hopefully Frank will soon be back at the community centre with nothing worse than a new scar to show for his fall. At the west of Scotland's Special Operations Base, it's the start of the night shift. Paramedics Brian and Craig are responding to an emergency call in Motherwell, out to the east of Glasgow. We're going to a male who's in the River Clyde in Motherwell. Don't have any other information at the moment other than he is in the water. Um, we'll hopefully get a wee update in the next few minutes. It's a warm summer night, 
which makes a certain kind of emergency that bit more likely. We do find that this time of year we get an increase in water jobs, especially inland water, um, like quarries, ponds, etc., where people are going swimming. Certainly in nicer nights like this, um, you'll tend to find that we start to get job. Mostly because people have been drinking alcohol and then they tend to go in the water and that's when they start getting into trouble. Sort team, Brian speaking. Sure enough, the night's already getting busy. In Govan? What's the story with the one in Govan? This is a second water emergency, this time further down the Clyde in Govan. That's all received, thank you. We're being diverted to somebody else in the water. We've got a male in the River Clyde to the police. Uh, the, the calls came from the police and the male is seen in the water. So ourselves and water rescue vehicle are going to attend the job in Govan and the other two vehicles are going to attend the job in Motherwell. There's a lot of police heading away. Can you get in this one? Play that one. After a short drive, Brian and Craig reach what they were told was the scene. 375, that scene. Just get right down there, I speak to them to see. But the situation is changing fast. Hi guys. Yeah. It's the other side. Is he still in the water? No, he's at the water, he's in with the cops. He's up, but he's on the other bank. Ah, he's on the other bank. Okay. Sort team leader to West Ham. Um, yeah, urgent message over. Yeah, we've liaised with the fire service at this job in Govan. The mail is actually on the opposite bank of the River Clyde, which is in South Street. Could you report this locus to South Street and we're going to make our way there over? The uh, mail is out of the water in the hands of the police, however, he is naked over. That's all received. Now we've established that this mail is now out of the water, our water rescue vehicle. Um, I've just redeployed that to the first job we were attending in Motherwell, where we've got a male still within the river, I believe, in Motherwell. The swimmer still might need treatment, so Craig and Brian waste no time heading to the other side, when they hit another unexpected complication. Oh, there's a guy stopping in the Clyde Tunnel. Oh, my God. No, oh, no way. <laughs> That's a dick, no. No, 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 no. It's a car coming, mate. Solid white line. Stop. <sighs> Unbelievable. Car just stopped in the middle of the Clyde Tunnel. <laughs> uh, double white line. Trying to think from where we were, he's going to be past the harbour down towards the transport museum. That was where that sort of bank was, was at the transport museum. Spotting the police presence, Craig and Brian finally reached the patient. Sort 375 on scene. Oh yeah. So what we're going to do, mate, we'll get you covered up. We're right. going to pop you in the back of this motor, OK? And we're going to make sure everything's all right. Hello? Hello. How you doing? This okay. young chap thought he'd go for a wee swim in the Clyde. The crews retrieve the swimmer's clothes. It looks like he has been drinking, but he isn't injured or ill. So Brian and Craig can move on to tonight's other water emergency, one that sounds increasingly concerning. OK, tell me exactly what's happened. I can make you lift him up, but I had that can't lift him myself. So what's happened? Has he fallen? He's fallen, yeah. When did this happen? When did he fall? Six o'clock this morning. So he's been on the floor since 6 a.m.? Yeah. On the other side of Glasgow, ambulance crew Johnny and Fraser are enjoying a bit of banter between jobs. <laughs> no. Do you smell bread? <laughs> If you've got a good crewmate and you go on well with them, you can have a laugh with them. It's like coming to work with your friend every day, so 
just makes it so much easier. They were going through like what the top complaints were for the ambulance service. Right. That people complained about. And do you know what it was? People complained about crews laughing and looking too happy and going to jobs with their blue lights on. Oh dear. That's mental. Stop smiling, stop smiling, can't smile. You never know, do they? It's like, we can't all be doom and gloom. I know, exactly. Wouldn't it last if it was doom and gloom? Then? Right, okay, left, mate. When you're on like with Fraser, you have a laugh and a joke, and but we do our job when, when that customer, when that patient's there, it's, it's game faces on and we do our job. And right now, another job has come in. Time to go to work. Uh, so we've been called to, I think it's a 68-year-old male um, who's been found on the floor. Uh, and bearing in mind it's now about half five-ish, I think he's been on the floor since about six o'clock this morning. He's had a fall at six o'clock and unable to get up. Um, by the notes that we can see, he's got a bit of a complex medical history, so we don't exactly know what kind of condition he's in at the moment, but he's unable to obviously get himself off the floor, and he's been unable to get raise the alarm until now. We get loads of people, uh, early people, who have fallen and who either have no family or friends mm -hmm. and get found either by carers later on. I think it must be that one. Yeah. I don't really see anywhere to park around there. Yeah, it's just fine. Fuck, we don't want. Hello, James. I'm John S. Fraser. How did you get on the floor, sir? I can't hide here. Your legs just went. Can you move it? Oh, uh, hmm? Aye. Let's see you move that leg. Right, good. Put that one down. Can you move this one, though? No. Okay. Is that sore? See, when you're talking to me right now, yeah. I'm struggling to make out what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, so are you. <laughs> Is that normal? How long has it taken here? Last two, 10 years? No, last two or three years. Two or three years? Yeah. You've just, your speech isn't as good as it used to be? Yeah, I had a stroke. You had a stroke, so this is normal yeah. for you? Yeah. Right, OK, yeah. OK. So I was just making sure that this speech problem wasn't a new thing, you know? Oh, no, no. Good. If zero was like no pain at all, and ten was the worst pain you've ever had, how bad is it just lying there? Oh, About six. So it's sore. And is it go? It's not going anywhere else, is it? No, it's just staying here in, in the in the back of your bum. Yeah. Did you fall in here, James, or did you fall outside and crawl through oh, here? No. Uh huh. When was the last time you had a fall, James? Oh. All the time. You live here yourself, James. Right. You have any family? I got I got Spain. Spain? Right, so they're not going to come anytime. Early patients, the bodies don't cope with being so still on hard surfaces for a long period of time. And there's a lot of internal things that can go on that will need checked for in hospital that will take a couple of days to appear. So, James, we need to pop you in the hospital. You are going to, you are so. You get that a lot with elderly patients. They'll, they'll say nothing's wrong with them when quite clearly it is. Because they, they don't want to bother you. They, they don't, certainly don't want to go to hospital. Um, and they'll do everything in their power to stay at home. So we need to get in and get an x-ray. OK. So that's why we need to get you in and look after you. OK, I know it's not the best. Let us get you up the royal. Well, the way his leg's sitting, um, it looks possibly like he's maybe broken his hip, unfortunately. Um, you can tell if, if, if the leg's lying a wee bit shorter and a wee bit rotated. Um, it's a possibility that the hip joint's, unfortunately, uh, broken. With no room to manoeuvre a stretcher, Fraser and Johnny will need to get James onto a chair. You've got a wee narrow corridor, which is a wee bit of a trouble. But well, as long as it's no sore, but what we want to try and do I see if we can sit you up a little bit, because if you can sit up, we can probably get you into our chair. Are you wanting any gas in here before we try and move you? Or we just lift you up? Right, hold on then. Ready, one, two, three. Two sore. Now I get purchase. OK. It became clear when we started to move him that he was in a bit more pain, he was sort of letting on. Um, which, again, he was just hiding. He just he didn't want to cause us trouble. He just wanted a hand off the floor. That's sore. 
Mm-hmm. See that jacket off? Got some of that gas. Too sore? Right, James. There you are. Slow, big, deep breaths. That's you, sir. That's right, good lad. Every single breath. Keep going. Keep it in your mouth. In and out. Oh, well, a little bit dizzy and lightheaded, but you're fine. We've got you. Perfectly safe now. That's you. OK, James. Good man. So it's well done. Some people tell you I've got a 10 out of 10 pain score and they're sitting here like myself. Don't look like they've got a 10 out of 10 pain score. I think most people over exaggerate their pain score, but yeah. I think if he said to me when we were moving and it was 10 out of 10, it was 10 out of 10, because I could see it on him. Hey James, going up. Doing well. I think we need something better for the pain though. Nothing, yeah. It was a bit sore than we thought. Yeah. Yeah. All right, my man. To manage James's pain, the crew administer morphine. Maybe we should have done this before we moved you. It's a bit sorer than you thought. Too independent, too strong willed you. Aye, aye. No. I feel, no, you don't get a fag. Yeah. No chance. That cigarette will have to wait, as James will now be checked in hospital and given the treatment he needs. Elsewhere in Glasgow, as night begins to fall, Special Operations Paramedics Brian and Craig are heading to their second water emergency of the evening. So, I take it, listening to the talk group there, we've not found this male in the water at Murrow. But it's, I confirmed that there is somebody in the water. It's being reported that a man has gone into the River Clyde and vanished. I'm going to go up and start to now to start to teach it. Just the proviso, uh, we do have a helicopter, a police helicopter, that's shooting the river at the moment. Uh, any further info we'll get back to you. Over. 4535 on scene at Rock Crest, over. Uh, I'll call James in the B65, being aware. Torches and light is required. Every water search is a race against time. A police helicopter has been scrambled to assist. The fire brigade are in attendance, but it's the special operations team who have the training and kit to get onto the river. They need to get out there fast. But in the dark and with incomplete information, it's unclear exactly where they should focus the search. John, I know that you're coordinating this. We're just looking for some confirmation as to what viaduct. Is it the railway viaduct or the road bridge viaduct at Hamilton Road? Yeah, and you can confirm that's where you're seeing something in the water. It was kind of important where we tried to establish a bit of communication with the fire service and police to try and figure out where where had been searched, where his last known position was, where the flow of the direction of the river is as well, because you can float down, or he could be caught in a branch or something like that, deep down. Uh, sometimes it can be very difficult, and even more so when the fact that it was extremely dark at night. When you get to the track, if you walk straight down, it will take you to underneath the viaduct. The team finds the viaduct, and another clue that tells them that this is the spot. The bank is steep, but there is a way down. But there's no sign of the missing person. To extend the search, the team need to get onto the water. The special operations team are the only emergency service with this capability. At an incident like this one, it can make the difference between life and death. Myself and John were in the boat uh, and doing a search in the deepest part of the water where there was nobody else able to go on foot. We have a sort of, you can call it a large periscope basically that's got 
a small viewing lens which is quite a large lens at the bottom and we'll pop that underneath the water and just get two lights on it and it gives us quite a good view of the water underneath if the water's clean. White bags? Aye. Body bags? I'm not too sure exactly why they went in. I don't know if it was just them or mucking about. Kids have been daft. The clock is ticking, but the team still haven't found the missing person. It's time to make a tough decision. Myself and one of my colleagues, we went into the water to do an active search and basically done a systematic search across the river, um, bank to bank, to ensure that there was nobody in the water. Um, during that search, we were using probes to probe the depth of the water um, and also to check and see if there was anybody under the surface of the water, um, which didn't turn up anything. The search has now been called off until first light, and that'll be coordinated by the police um, first thing in the morning, and it'll probably now be a recovery for police divers. The person's now been in the water over 60 minutes, and our guidelines will stipulate that um, they're not a viable resuscitation after 60 minutes. There was some um, youths down there when we arrived who were quite distressed and quite anxious that their friend had went into the water and not surfaced. So they were able to give us some information and a good indication of where that person went in the water and where they disappeared. Um, and that's where we focused our search. Um, however, we did extend that search for about a 300 metre sort of radius um, and there was still no sign of that person to be found. next time. A mishap on Mull means an airlift to hospital. A holiday maker in Edinburgh is struggling to breathe. Coughing quite a lot recently, is that what you were yeah, saying? Yeah. yeah, I thought he was going to die last night. The driving instructor in agony... We'll take a deep breath in. ..needs emergency treatment. And a morning bike ride turns into a bit of a bloodbath. It's a pure hard man, isn't he?